to begin with a few introductory words. I'm Malcolm Ramsey, Chair of Hartford Civic Society. Tonight's speaker is Richard Bullen. He is the Chair of CPRE Hart. He'll be talking to us about the complexities of the white paper on planning, which it's fair to say embodies some controversial aspects. <coughs> Hartford Civic Society has been a corporate member of Hart's CPRE for some time, and we've enjoyed other talks by then. Tonight, Richard Bourne is joined by two CPRE colleagues, trustee Alison Young and planning manager Chris Berry. As you can all see, we have a large audience, around 60. This includes Frida Challoner, chair of the St Albans Civic Society, and her colleague Morag Ormiston. They will contribute to the general discussion from the slightly different perspective of St Albans. And there are plenty of other distinguished guests, as you also know, including uh, the MP for Hartford, Julie Mars. So now, with great pleasure, we hand over to Richard Bullen. And I should perhaps mention, he's going to talk for roughly 45 minutes. And it's probably sensible if you uh, turn off your video and mute. So this will enhance reception. And if you sneeze or do something odd, it won't matter. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here this evening. Uh, the complexity is the planning white paper. Part of the complexity is that uh, this planning white paper went out to consultation in uh, late uh, 2020, and about 40,000 people responded to that consultation. The government is now looking at the responses to the consultation and has told the world that sometime in the spring, they will respond to those responses. So um, there's a still a great deal um, potentially up for grabs. All I can do this evening is try and take you through um, the, the outlines of the planning white paper. Now I've added those worlds and the world of planning because nothing happens in a vacuum. There is context and there's quite a lot of context. I, I'm limiting it to uh, little bits as I go along, but um, I hope I find, you find what I've got to say to be interesting. Um, you are being, you and I are all being recorded, as, as you will have seen, for posterity, um, for what that's worth. And uh, I'll take questions at the end. Um, use the, the chat facility, if you will, to raise your questions. And then, obviously, if, if there, there, there are questions which could be uh, combined, that would be absolutely great. And I'll ask um, uh, Alison and Chris to help me because um, they are professional planners and of the Troika, I am not. I'm merely the chairman of, of, of the charity. We do a lot of other things other than planning, although the planning function is vitally, vitally important. Now, this is, these are the, the, the headlines of the planning white paper and the impact it will have on local plans. First of all, uh, there are going to be three zones and these are where uh, housing uh, and development may um, uh, will, may and will not take place. I'll come, I'll come to these in, in detail. Um, the basis on which plans are going to be assessed, which today is the soundness of the plan. Uh, that's what the planning inspector um, expects to get to, uh, finding the whole plan to be sound. And if it is sound, unless it's called in by the Secretary of State, the plan will then be adopted by the local authority. The proposal is that there will be three zones in every local uh, plan area. Now, the first is the, the growth area. And as it says here, uh, the, the, this is all from the white paper, this, uh, that it's going to be for comprehensive development. Now, what does comprehensive development mean? We, we don't know because there's no definition. But in all probability, it means that if, if there's going to be substantial housing development, there must also be the developments that must go with housing which are obviously the services, uh, water, wastewater, uh, power supplies, um, obviously roads, but more importantly still, um, uh, medical services and uh, education services. So there's a great deal that has to go into these growth areas. And it intrigues me how this is going to be done in this county. We, we have quite large um, urban areas in the south of the county and of course at Stevenage. But most of the county doesn't have very, uh, we don't have very, very large urban areas in the county. So it's tricky to see where these growth areas are going to be 
unless they're going to be the trampoline on the green belt, which all the plans have a, in, in, in at the moment. So the growth areas then include these new settlements, whatever that means. I think these are the greenfield developments and urban extensions. We have it, it, urban extensions is, is an interesting word because uh, the purposes of the green belt include not uh, village towns and villages not joining up. So we'll have to be uh, watch how these urban extensions work. And then we come on to the brownfield land, the former industrial sites. Now, every local authority has to maintain a brownfield register. Um, and uh, most brownfield registers have sites which are not particularly interesting uh, to the large developers because they're relatively small sites. The large former industrial sites across the county have gone for development. Not all of them, but most have. And then we've got these urban regeneration sites. Now, there are not too many of those in Hertfordshire. Uh, this has been a, a growth, a, you know, a, 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 not, not using these growth area as in this slide, but um, through the 1930s, when uh, there was the massive um, unemployment areas elsewhere in the UK, the unemployment rate um, in most of Hertfordshire was below 2%. So it's been a, a, a rapid growth area through the years, and we haven't got these sites for urban regeneration on the whole, but they do exist in, in, in other areas. Right, now the renewal areas. This is the uh, amber zone in terms of the, the, the colours. Um, and um, as it says, um, the second line is perhaps the most interesting, the, the gentle densification. I wonder really what that means and how that's going to be done. Um, I, as I've, I've said already, but uh, I'll repeat, I live in, in St Albans district. Now there are areas of, uh, in St Albans district where um, it's not uncommon to see um, a housing development where each house sits in hmm, a, a fraction of an acre, a, quite a large fraction of an acre. Now, you might say if you're going to do de gentle densification, well, fine, buy up five, five of these dwellings, million pounds a piece. You've got an acre and then you can put 12 uh, dwellings on, on that, that same site. Hmm, quite how that will work out, I really don't know. But so uh, gentle densification and infill sound interesting words, but how it's all going to be delivered, I think it's very, very unclear. Development in town centres. Now, that is an interesting one because um, before the pandemic, there was a great deal of interest in um, housing being in town centres. We, we know that town centres um, all over the place are slowly dying. Um, with the closure of uh, uh, so many stores, Debenhams being the, the most prominent, probably, but uh, lots of uh, empty shops in most high streets. There certainly are in St. Peter's Street in St. Albans. And uh, the idea is that uh, you, you have to bring footfall back into the town centres and make them attractive places for um, mainly younger people uh, to live. Um, if there's employment, as well as retail, as well as leisure, uh, facilities in town centres that will attract people, or at least it would before we had the pand pandemic, where it seems that people want to go out to green spaces to uh, to live, um, appreciating the, the virtues of the countryside. But we'll see what the new normal looks like when we get to the end of the pandemic. And then the development in rural areas, small sites on the edge of villages. Yes, well, these should be in neighbourhood plans, of course. Um, but... Uh, We'll see how that, that all goes. So it's not at all clear how this middle band, this amber band, is really going to work. In the, the, the central, uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the, the red zone, there's permitted, there, there, it, there's, um, nobody has to get um, planning permission, outline planning permission. That's already established. Um, in the renewal areas, it, uh, it doesn't appear you have to get planning permission, but it's not clear exactly what the nature is. Because if we go on to the, uh, the, the so as I was saying, the, 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 in the growth area, well, I, I, this is a bit, a bit of a busy slide. So forgive me, uh, just if, if, the national planning policy framework um, is the, the key document um, in, in planning. It doesn't. Have quite have the force of law, but it's backed by law. But um, whether a plan adheres to the national planning policy framework is a key consideration 
or every planning inspector reviewing um, a, a, a local authority's plan. Now, uh, as, the, as I write there, uh, the creation of high quality buildings in places is fundamental to what the planning and development process should achieve. Getting good design, described there as a key aspect of sustainable development, and remember that there's going to be a sustainability test for all these plans. So sustainable development has a large part to play uh, in, in this. You need to get in before the plan is actually published what good design means. Because with this automatic outline planning permission granted, you can't refuse uh, 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 that permission and you can't insist on design which is not already in a design guide. Let's, let's. Now, at the beginning of last year, um, the country, uh, 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 there was published a, a housing de uh, audit, a design audit for England. Now, uh, the commission for uh, the, um, uh, the, the CABE, uh, the commission, I can remember what the A stands for, but the B is the built environment, carried out a quite limited uh, housing audit um, about 10 years ago. Now, uh, CABE was abolished by the uh, coalition government, uh, but... Uh, in 2019, the uh, CPRE, the, the national charity, together with Place Alliance and some others, decided they would carry out this, um, uh, the audit of, 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 uh, of developments that have taken place. They put together a questionnaire uh, to be uh, used to, to do this um, audit, and they got uh, planning specialist volunteers to look at these 142 housing uh, schemes. Um, reasonable size, uh, not very small sites, and all within the last five years. Now, they ranked everything um, very good, good, mediocre, bad, or very bad. Um, quite a few people thought that if the site was mediocre, that was less than average. But they're, they're the five categories they used. And as I show there, three quarters were in the bottom three categories with only 25% found to be good or very good. Now, the National Planning Policy Framework encourages local authorities to refuse planning permission if the design of a, 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 of a, a proposal is poor or very poor. They should not have received planning permission because good design is at the heart of sustainable development. So. Why were these sites allowed? Well, they're allowed in part because local authorities don't want to take on developers because they haven't got the money to take them through the courts, particularly if they're going to lose. In addition to that, planning departments have been cut back since 2010 very substantially, and they haven't got all the skills they need to do some of the jobs which the NPPF assumes will be done by planning departments. Come on. Now, okay, some more conclusions from this um, audit. Um, East of England, where we are, uh, the East of England, uh, ourselves, Bedfordshire, um, um, Cambridge, Peter, Peterborough, um, Essex, um, Suffolk and Norfolk, were below the average compared to all the other regions of England. Indeed, our score, as it says there, declined overall. So not a good result uh, in this part of the world. I mentioned design uh, guides, design codes. Um, uh, it says you're much more likely, if you have one of these design codes in place, to get good or very good um, uh, uh, um, design. Now, the, the reality is that most of the large cities in this country do have design codes in place. Nottingham led the way, uh, but Bristol certainly has one in place now, and Manchester is developing theirs. So if you want to do developments within the city of Nottingham, you have to 
adhere to that design code. You will not get planning permission if you don't adhere to that design code. But what this audit um, showed was that there were some greenfield uh, developments taken place on, on uh, greenfield sites, not associated immediately with, with any um, existing urban area. Some of those, not very many, were good. There were no very good in those schemes, but there were some good ones. And this seems to show that the large developers work on a regional basis and some regional managers of these, company, uh, these companies are more interested in effective design than some others. But I go back to what I was saying before, it is absolutely imperative for the growth and renewal areas that there is a design code in place before anything else is done. Otherwise, you won't get good design. Now, I read in Planning Magazine, we get Planning Magazine uh, almost every day uh, online at the moment, that uh, there have been some cases where large developments in relatively rural areas, the developer has been able to defy the local authority and not adhere to a design guide. So uh, this is something we're gonna have to watch very carefully indeed and ensure that our local authorities, East Hearts there, St Albans where I am, um, all the rest of them do uh, make sure, we have to make sure that, that there are, they have these design codes in place and they are actively used on every large scale development case, particularly in these growth and renewal areas. It's imperative, otherwise we're gonna get um, slums, frankly, Now, the protected land, this is the, 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 the green colour, the protected land, and it, as it says, it, 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 it's, it's, there's, there's very little change in these areas uh, where there is now. These are not the areas where, which are scheduled keyed, uh, um, 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 for development, but development will take place. Um, the areas of outstanding natural beauty is very interesting. Over in um, Three Rivers, um, it was last year now, I don't think it's been resolved, the developer put forward plans for either 300 houses or 800 houses on a site which is in the area of outstanding natural beauty in Three Rivers District. Um, and one of the worst cases is actually down at the uh, AONB in Dover, where a large development has taken place. So unfortunately, these areas of outstanding natural beauty, which you would think would be exempt from large scale developments, it, it, they're not, it does take place. There are two AONBs in the county. There's a small one in East Arts and the large one is uh, shared between uh, Three Rivers and Decorum Borough and is the Chilterns uh, AONB. Uh, we do have uh, three triple SIs um, in the county. I regret to say, I can't remember where they, they are. Um, conservation areas, um, um, I have to think this refers to um, those areas in, in, in towns and, and villages uh, where there are limits on what can be done. These are cons conservation areas. Uh, open countryside not earmarked for growth. That's a bit of a, th a threatening stage because there must be open countryside which is earmarked for growth. And that takes me back to well, what I was saying. How on earth are these zones to be fitted into uh, our town, uh, towns with the surrounding uh, countryside? Well, we'll see. Oh, bear in mind that there are 10 local authorities in, 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 in Hertfordshire, and only uh, three of them have land which is not in the Greenbelt. Um, Broxbourne um, doesn't have Greenbelt. Stevenage doesn't, uh, has a little bit of, uh, sorry, the, the three that don't have, uh, have land which is not in the Greenbelt are East Hearts, North Hearts and Decorum Borough. All the rest, including Watford and Stevenage, Watford has very little Greenbelt land, but it does have some. All the rest outside of the large settlements are all Greenbelt. So in St Albans district, where I say I live, St Albans, Harpenden, Wheat Hampstead and Redbourne are outside of the Greenbelt but every other square metre of land in St Albans district is Greenbelt. And the Conservative Party manifesto contained the words, we will protect the Greenbelt. I suspect somebody might have their fingers crossed while they type that out. 
Anyway, that's by the by, I mustn't be political. Yes. And uh, the final thing about the protected land is that planning permissions uh, will be sought as now. So we should be responding to these planning permissions as we do. Now, sustainable development. This is the test that there's going to be. It's interesting, the duty to cooperate is going to be abolished. I, I'm not sure I understand why that is, because that is absolutely fundamental to the planning system as we have today. Um, indeed, St Albans uh, the plan was turned down by a planning inspector because they'd failed to meet their duty to cooperate. And uh, I don't think the, 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 the planning department at St Albans District City and District Council has recovered since. Slim down? Uh, yes, it, it has to be because uh, there's going to be a re reduced time for production of local plans. It goes down to 30 months. At the moment, you, be, you measure it in years. It really is going to reduce down. Uh, it's going to be have to be rushed through. And there are big concerns um, that um, CPRE is not the only people to, to be concerned about this, that uh, democracy it might not be fully operative within this, this new system. Um, at the moment, uh, plans go out for consultation at least twice as they are being developed. Uh, at the moment, the decorum of Borough Plan, the it's emerging strategy for growth, is out for consultation, a consultation that closes at the end of um, February. Um, and this, this is what every local authority does. But um, with a red zone, you're not going to go out for those sorts of uh, consultations. Um, we we need, need to know, this is not yet fixed, exactly how the community is going to contribute to its assessment of, uh, of how the planning for its uh, community is going to be uh, carried out. Now, a new standard method for establishing housing numbers. This and um, these words sent a chill up the back of back uh, of all sorts of Conservative MPs for rural areas around London, because when this first came out, it looked as though there was going to be a thirty-five percent uplift for virtually every local authority. In, in the green belt around London. But that's changed. Uh, and that 35% uh, uh, uplift refers to all London boroughs and uh, 50 odd large uh, towns and cities ac across England, but nowhere in this county. Nonetheless, the government uh, target 300 homes uh, each year is there. And there still is Although not so disclosed as it was, there still is an affordability test within um, what the housing numbers for each local authority. It's figures from the Office of National Statistics that form the basis of where um, uh, every local authority gets starts its assessment of what housing um, it has to be to be built in its area. Um, it's not. It's the start point. It's not the finish point. It's the start point, and there, there are various bits of flexing that have to go on after that. The ONS um, produce, uh, produces um, these assessments periodically, and the two most important ones of later, 2014 and 2018. Now, I've put down there the housing numbers. These are per annum housing numbers. Um, East Hearts is a settled plan, so it's slightly irrelevant. But East, in East Hearts, according to the 2014 uh, ONS uh, uh, um, uh, assessment, it's 1,145 dwellings per annum have to be built. If the 2018 numbers uh, were used, it would be 710, down 38%. So Torbans, as it says there, uh, between 2000, the, the 2008 assessment would mean the housing numbers come down by 55% and 54% in Hartsmere. But the government is insisting that the 2014 assessments must be the start point. They will not allow uh, how, uh, local authorities to use the 2018 numbers, even though the national planning policy framework says that local authorities should take account of um, new information. And if 2018 is not more new information than 2014, I don't know what is. But nonetheless, um, I think it's going to be a very, very hard task to persuade the planning inspector that 2018 assessments from the ONS can be used as the basis point. Uh, we're going to get far more housing than we need. And um, by the way, I don't know if anybody saw in last Friday's Times, um, one of the writers there was quoting from the ONS, 
the, um, the population replacement rate for the UK is 2.1 um, babies per, per, per household. And it's been above two for many years. But now, according to the ONS, it's down at 1.6. And at 1.6, we will have a declining population. Now, it's not going to be cut in immediately, of course. It's going to take time. But the ONS thinks uh, has downgraded its uh, uh, um, forecast for population growth and therefore for housing numbers. And the ONS has shown that we will have a declining population unless measures are taken to increase uh, 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 the population, and which affordable housing may be one of the, or the lack of affordable housing may be one of the uh, uh, hindrances to uh, forming bigger families. We are going to have a great deal of um, um, housing planned for which there is no demand. And sites are going to be blighted. Development may not take place uh, until the last um, third of the current plan period. So these, these sites will remain as they are now, largely farming land, but there will be no certainty about what will stay. And um, well, uh, it's not going to be pleasant. Whereas in the red zone, where the planning permission is, uh, you know, it's, it's out, uh, it is already there, the demand for that land is going to, uh, well, I can't imagine what's going to happen to demand from developers for that land. At the moment, these are the decorum numbers. I said the decorum plan is, is at consultation at the moment. And again, using the 2014 and 2018 numbers, we can see the numbers roughly halve. And um, further, building those 1,022 dwellings per year means that a large amount of greenbelt land and green spaces will be given up for development. They'll be concreted over. 850 hectares. That's a large area. Now, in 2018, the Letwin Review was published. It was commissioned by the government, and the Letwin there is uh, was was is Sir Oliver Letwin, who was a leading figure in the government at the time, and it was employed to look at why build-out rates um, it took so long. Now, the, what the Letwin Review actually uh, showed was that for a site of a thousand dwellings, and it looked at um, it, the minimum site it looked at had five hundred dwellings, but uh, a thousand dwelling site uh, took on average 15.1 years to build out and as I say this uh, say there uh, this it's so slow because the developers work on this absorption rate how many houses can they sell without adversely disturbing the prices of second-hand homes in the same area that's what controls the building rate it's got nothing to do with the government target. It's got everything to do with the profitability of the house builders. And, you know, we look at, I'm not criticising that at all. Um, but if you don't take this context, this particular context in, 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 uh, in place, you get to get disappointed. And local authorities can be penalised for not de uh, delivering housing, which they've set as targets. It's not within their control. The, they're not doing the building. It's, it's the private sector constructors who will be doing the building. And then this, 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 this quote came out of the Letwin Review as well about the, the RICS, um, the Bible for surveyors. And uh, any valuation they do is an open market valuation. So again, going back to that red zone, what's an open market valuation going to be on a zone where the maximum amount of development is going to take place? Land prices are going to rocket. If they rocket anyway, it's been shown that land prices for agricultural purposes, when uh, a, a, a piece of agricultural land gets into a local authority plan, it increases in value by 192 times. 192 times. In London, it's 200 it's plus, it's more than 200, it's about 208 times, as I remember. But for the rest of the country, it's 192 times. 
That's why uh, affordability is such an issue, that it's a finite amount of land, but the demand for it is such that you get this huge uplift in land values. And that's not much taxed. Climate change. Now, there's more and more interest in climate change. I'm not a member of the Extinction Rebellion, rebellion but I don't have anything against them. The ruling uh, piece of legislation for our current planning system is this, the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. And uh, it includes uh, an obligation, as it says there, on local authorities in their plans, taken as a whole, to introduce measures to mitigate, mitigate the impact of climate change. Now, here's going back to decorum, that 850 hectares of green space, which decorum borough will have to take out of uh, green belt and green space for the development that takes place, appears, as far as one, uh, all the evidence shows, will, uh, at the moment absorbs 400 tonnes of CO2 every year. And CO2, of course, is the principle of greenhouse gas. So decorum borough will have to get uh, within their plan, and we will campaign on this very firmly, unless it takes measures in the rest of its plan to deal with the loss of uh, greenhouse gas absorption that green spaces uh, can take on in the rest of their plan. And of course, this is relevant for every other local authority because they're all subject to this. They'll not get away with it. Permitted development rights. Now, this is one of the most contentious uh, 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 things that is going on. Um, permitted development rights. This is not part of the housing white paper. This came out of the, 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 the same sort of time. It, it is a changing world because the government, I think, is rowing back on some of the things that they said they would do. But still, it is the case that if you are a, a owner, if you are, own your own home, you have the right to erect two additional floors on top of your dwelling for your personal use. And that doesn't matter whether you're in uh, a detached home or a, a, a terraced or semi-detached home. And I understand Linda Hazy, who chairs East Hearts uh, District Council, told me that I think it's in Bishop Stortford, the first case to come forward where in a terraced property, one of the owners wanted to put the two floors above their property. Um, Local authorities get involved because, of course, the, the, the building regulations have to be sorted out. Um, use classes, the, the last bullet point I've got there, um, when these first came out, um, they, they, they've been simplified and it looked as though pubs, clubs, nightclubs could establish themselves in any premises anywhere. But the, that, that, they've been amended to avoid that risk. But it remains the case that if a property remains empty for six months, it can be demolished and something else can be uh, built in its place. So these shops which are empty, six months time, they can go for housing. You can get a use change at the end of that six months time. This is a, a moving feast. We, this is not settled, um, but uh, there's been no change yet to that first bullet point. It's the use classes for business class, which are changing. And I don't think we've got the end of those changes. But the uh, building regulations have been tightened up uh, because of the, the risk of um, building these two floors on, uh, on existing dwellings. Um, the structure must be, of course, be, be very sound. Right. As I hope I've explained to you uh, uh, to some degree, very major changes are proposed. It's, this is my view, that evidence and context are apparently ignored or overlooked. We don't know when the white paper will turn into legislation. It's going to take some time and it will be primary legislation because it has to overturn the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, you want to follow up on what I've talked to you today, that's the email address to come to. Don't phone the office. The office is shut. We won't take incoming phone calls. And we will be putting uh, plenty of information onto our website. That's our website address there.
that's what I was, uh, I'm always proposing to, to say this evening. So um, I'll be happy to try and take questions. I should be relying on Chris and Alison to help me with answering those questions. Thanks very much for your patience.